Uh, okay, hello everyone. My name's Andy Ferris. Uh, first, I'd really like to thank Simon for such a great introduction uh, to my talk. <laughs> Just joking. No, it was really, really good, really good, interesting ideas from uh, Simon. And it was good to see. Uh, and I'd also like to just acknowledge my employers who, who got me here, and uh, yeah, thanks to the organisers for having me. Um, yeah. So this this system, this talk is 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 paraphrased punishing Julia's type system. I'm actually going to run through in this 10-minute lightning talk four packages. Um, we've had the nice introduction to how data data types work, and and Simon more or less explained how type tables works already um, by 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 you know. Uh, more, st more keeping more information about the type of, of the columns that you're keeping. Uh, but as, as you mentioned, there were, there were a few small um, syntactical problems and other problems with, with that approach in Julia. Um, and I just thought it'd be really nice if we had these things called generated types. Um, and it turns out you can make a kind of weird package, a total hack for doing this in Julia 0.4. Um, I sort of came across this. Uh, uh, inspired by this after reading the implementation of Fast Anonymous, so thank you Tim Holly, wherever you are. Um, and from that we can make generated tables, which I hopefully I'll have time to get to at the end. Um, so as we saw, a table, I mean, it, it, it is a thing that looks like this. What we know about tables is, you know, in, in some sense maybe they're some collection of columns. Um, each column will probably typically have the same type all along down it. Um, however, uh, it, you can also think of a table a, as more or less a vector of rows. And there was a small discussion at the end of the last talk about what is a table. Well, you could say a table should inherit from a vector, abstract vector of rows in one sense. In Julia, that might make sense. Or, or maybe that a row is just a tuple of data or something like that. OK, or is, is a... Um, a table, a two-dimensional array of cells. Well, I don't think that, that picture really fits in very well with Julia's type system, I suppose. So it's probably more, more you would store it in one of the first two ways in Julia. Um, yeah. So uh, as we saw, I think we saw a part of the data frame definition in the last talk as well. But it more or less stores um, columns as a, as a vector of vectors or, or some storage type data, data arrays. Um, uh, and some index which, which helps you map the symbol name to, to which, col um, which column number of, of that vector it is. Um, but yeah, the thing here is like there's an any there, you just don't know what, what type is coming out when you try and extract things from that vector. Um, so, I mean, data frame is very nice. It has like this really beautiful constructor syntax where you can name the columns with keyword arguments as, as you bring them in. And um, you know has some some nice output at the REPL and, and, and all these sort of things. It's a really nice package, lots of features. Um, but unfortunately, when you do try and get uh, access one of the, the the columns, what comes out is um, well. In this case, it's figured out that, that both columns are, are arrays, but um, it's of type any more or less. Oh no, no, it hasn't figured that out at all. Sorry, I'm mis misreading that. So the workaround here is um, you can extract, first you would extract the columns and pass them to worker functions which would then iterate through all the different rows and do the thing you want to do to your table when you want to manipulate the data, okay, with helper functions. Um, so in type tables we store the columns in a very similar way except instead of as a um, vector of, of columns, we store it as a tuple of, of columns. And in Julia, that's, just en that's already enough to, to get you strong type information about, about your columns. We also have in the uh, parameters the names. Maybe it's a tuple of symbols in this case. It is a tuple of symbols for type tables, um, which lets you access the, the right column by, by using that. Okay? And um, so by using a very large number of generated functions, <laughs> You, you can actually get this through uh, type inference and, and, and have really fast code coming out, even for row by row access. So here I can, in the top line, uh, I'm using a macro to construct the table. It's just a slightly more convenient syntax. It's the same as the data frame. Um, uh, and and uh, we have some more pretty output again. Um, but when, when, when you look at the, the, the return types here of, um, 
of get index for columns, you can see that you're actually getting, if you're, if you're getting the age column, which was indicated by that val age, you actually get array in 64.1. And if you get, if you want to look at a particular row by indexing with an integer, you actually get a, a row with a well-defined well type and everything, signature. Yeah. So there are some pros and cons of this. It is fast, uh, something like 100 times faster uh, for BIMO benchmarking than data frames for row by row access. So that, that's, a, that's a big thing if you actually want to think about accessing your data that way. Four more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Uh, it is type safe. So, you know, you don't have to add any more function barriers or anything. You just write it like normal Julia code. And I've included some dplyr like macros for select and filter, which, um, well, they actually implement, I guess, they try and implement pretty similar syntax to, to the type of thing Simon was just talking about for what you'd want here. Um, but with, uh, how do I say, um, when you're computing a function, you use an anonymous function like syntax. So it, 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 the macro can tell which things are, are coming from the table and which, things, which symbols are just meant to be scoped from outside, just local scope. Okay, so um, I, I don't have much time to run through this because I want to talk about generated tables also. Um, the, the difficulty is uh, the annoying syntax with the val and some, having to use macros everywhere. Um, and you kind of need to know all the types in advance and maybe even the column names if you're loading from a file and things like that. So maybe you'd have to use function barriers when you're loading from files and, and stuff like that. So uh, yeah. Um, so there are some, some cons and, and I think Simon mentioned them too. Um, so, so what if I could make, um, so, so for instance, this syntactical problem, that in a data frame, you can just access a column by its symbol. Here, in type tables, you have to add this val. But what we really want, I mean, we talk about a column name as, as a field, right? Um, what we really want is a field called age and table. And maybe we could use this syntax with a macro. But um, can we do that in native Julia? Well, it's a bit difficult that the type system in Julia doesn't really let you define the, um, the names of the, of, the, of the fields. You can't overload get field. But, um, it turns out that, yes, we can actually create something like a generated type, uh, which lets you do this. Um, well, at least I've done this. I'm, I'm pretty sure it works well. Um, so I hacked together this, this thing called generatedtypes.jl, and it works like a generated function, except with a capital G, because we're using types. Um, and like a generated function, the body of the thing returns an expression, an expression block or an expression. Um, that it would sort of splat into to some other type. It could create some, some leaf type, which is some concrete type, um, dynamically with a, with a generated function. Okay, so, so if we, when, when, you, when, you, when you run this first capital G generated macro, it creates an abstract called type. And then when you use that as a constructor, the constructor is a generated function, which creates a type, uh, a, um, a name mangled, uh, concrete type with no parameters, okay, and uh, then then it just refers the, that generated function just refers to the concrete types constructor, so it's all transparent to the user more or less. There's a few caveats, um, and so I created this experimental thing, uh, generated tables. Uh, you can check it out. You can try and use it. Uh, it does not work on point five currently. Um, uh, yeah, but it lets you do this extremely cool thing that you can just, like, my table's called t, and I can just type t.age and extract the age column of t this way. So, um, again, you could, you could use a macro for the constructor at the, at the top earlier line, and everything would, would feel a little bit more natural, I think, um, with, with these generated types. So I don't know if that's a thing that could, could, could continue working in Julia.5 and beyond, but yeah, hopefully. Um, yeah, so I went quite fast. Thank you. Um, if you want to look at this work, you can, you can type those things in to check them out. Uh, again, going back to my employer, we're actually hiring at the moment. So if you're interested in, in living in a nice subtropical climate and uh, in Australia, and uh, 
you know, doing interesting work and obviously having time to do interesting hacking on Julia, which probably appeals to people at this conference. Um, yeah, come talk to us, come see Chris's talk, and uh, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, so um, the, the column types are not specified in any way. It's up to the user to use a nullable array. You could use an array fire array, a distributed array. It doesn't really matter. It, it just it more or less behaves um, like a, a, um, a vector of rows, and, and that's where it does its computations. And that's actually, yeah, that's the fastest way to actually use them. <laughs> um, so, so that's fine if it's a distributed array and like it'll sequentially go through using the iterators and things. And so it should be compatible with all those different paradigms. I think. <laughs> I think. <laughs> oh, question Adam. Adam, you have a view. Uh, Sorry. Um, so obviously the subtitle was punishing the compiler. So <laughs> how bad are compile times? Uh, oh, I use it interactively and it doesn't bother me. Uh, you do get this funny thing, like you, you just want to view a table and it takes like three quarters of a second, one second before it shows it and that kind of thing. But then the second time you show it, it's instant. So it is, we're talking only a couple seconds. It's not like trying to load PyPlot for the first time or something. It's, it's uh, yeah. Have you found there's a difference between a type, a type table with n columns versus like... You know, I haven't benchmarked like, columns. yeah, so... Uh, there's a magic number in Julia also to do with tuples. Uh, it was 8, and then 42, and then 8, and then 42, and now it's 16, um, which says how long a tuple is before inference gives up, um, and that kind of thing. Uh, so I haven't really done the benchmarking for the very large numbers of columns. It's certainly an important thing. Um, the generator types won't have that problem, I think. So, yeah. Generated tables? Generated tables, yeah, because yeah, yeah, it's just a simple struct in Julia then. Yeah.